Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. We are so excited to have you with us. I'm Brenda Asari, President and CEO of the Alfred Group. I know many of you are familiar with the Alfred Group, but for those of you who are not, the Alfred Group is a national folk service consulting firm specializing in the nonprofit and social sectors. We offer services and fundraising, strategic planning, corporate partnership strategy, data analytics, interim staffing, and much more. Our main goal is to provide guidance, tools, and structures that empowers organizations to have the greatest impact possible. On behalf of the entire team here, welcome to the second webinar in our fall webinar series. This webinar series runs through October and covers a variety of topics in philanthropy. All of the webinars are free. It will be posted on our website. I'll speak more on that at the end of today's presentation. Today's webinar is entitled, Communicating Your Philanthropic Value Proposition, Four Secrets to Messaging Success. Also joining me today is my colleague, Joanne Yoshimoto, a senior consultant in our Seattle office. I have a few housekeeping items before we get started. Today's webinar is approved for one CFRE credit point for those of you who are seeking CFRE certification or recertification. The webinar is being recorded and we will have a recording available for you after the event along with the slides. Please look for an email later today with both of these as well as a short survey asking for your feedback. Everyone joining us is in listen-only mode for the duration of the webinar. We will have time at the end of our presentation to take questions. If you have a question at any time during the webinar, please type your question using the chat function. We will answer as many questions as possible during the question and answer at the end. Lastly, we invite you to join us on Twitter throughout the webinar using the hashtag NPOStrength. We will be live tweeting and invite you to join the conversation there as well. Here is the agenda for today's webinar. First, we will discuss what a philanthropic value proposition is and why it's needed. Then we will reveal to you the four secrets to messaging success. Next, we'll walk you through a case study, talk about the different communication platforms, and wrap up with a Q&A session. So with that, let's get started. So let's start by defining philanthropic value proposition before we delve into how to, to communicate it. So a philanthropic value proposition uh, describes the value your donors gain and how they create change through your organization. It answers the fundamental question, why should I give to your organization? Just to clarify, a philanthropic value proposition is not a document per se. Rather, it's an overarching, cohesive approach to communication that is used to inform the creation of documents and other forms of communication. It explains how donor support of your organization brings a benefit to the community. It instills a sense of purpose that the donor could not achieve without you. It allows the donor to make an informed decision about philanthropic support. And it clearly communicates who you are, what meaningful work you do, and why current and prospective donors should support your organization. A strong philanthropic value proposition matters because it motivates donors. It provides them with reasons and rationale to make their own decision. It also empowers donors to enlist the support of others. They're not, it's not always an individual who is the sole decision maker, but sometimes they have to enlist support from a spouse, a fellow trustee, or others. And then a, a strong PVP 
appeals to both mind and spirit. You know, when a strong philanthropic value proposition is lacking, the prospective donor is left asking, well, so what? Why does this work matter? What is the measurable impact? You know, what real difference will this make? So I like to spend a few minutes talking about the four secrets. And it starts with being bold. The acronym B-O-L-D with B standing for benefit. So the question that you're really trying to address for your philanthropic donor, for your volunteer leaders, and even for your organization, is you're really answering the question of what's in it for me. Uh, Joanne referenced the, you know, why should someone give to your organization? This is the opportunity for you to develop a message platform that clearly expresses the positive outcome of your work. You know, we hear a lot about what is the impact, what is the difference that my organization is making. With the competition for donor mind share and wallet share, it is critical that we look at the benefit of your organization in terms of the preferred outcome, um, what is compelling about the work that your organization is doing, more and more what we're seeing is uh, this weaving together of the story. So what's the story of impact? And, and remembering, the story doesn't have to be about 500 people. It's the story of how your organization is changing one life, one life at a time. And then looking at what is the value of your organization to the clients, to the donors, to your community. So, so when you think about one of the first secrets is what is the benefit of your organization, what is the impact, and what's in it for the donor in terms of the change that your organization is making in the marketplace. The next, next secret is opportunity. This is the opportunity for the donor to typically uh, be engaged at your in your organization at the highest level. And never out, you know, overlook a call to action. And, and what we're looking for here is the understanding that philanthropy is a very personal um, endeavor. Um, we talk about the heart and head or the mind and spirit um, of the, the philanthropic value proposition. Um, it's a connection. This is where you as an organization, you're building uh, a connection to that donor where the donor really feels that um, something greater than themselves um, is being accomplished, something that they are a part of making happen for the community in the lives of uh, your clients or constituents whom you're serving. Um, this connection leads to what we want to see, uh, transformational gifts. You know, oftentimes we see, you know, language that feels very transactional. We want to move donors from a transactional relationship, which is a short term, um, give us the money now without much of a brand promise on what the benefit or the result will be. But we're moving donors from transactional giving to transformational giving. And, and again, it's all about partnering and collaboration. We're seeing more and more where donors just don't want to write a check or make a gift online. They really want to understand the value of the partnership that's being accomplished. Um, they also want to make sure that, um, that, that they're a part of making something meaningful happen through their support of your organization. Um, I, I think, you know, it goes without saying, we hear a lot about donor-centric um, philanthropy, and that really involves putting the donor at the center of, of that partnership, of creating the change that you're looking to create in your community, in the lives of the individuals um, whom you are serving. And this is a very uh, customized approach. One size does not fit all. And you're going to see that as a part of uh, the case example that we're going to share with you. So again, we want to make sure as we look at the O, that that O is very donor-centered, and it really focuses on delighting the donor so they can experience the joy of supporting your organization by making a meaningful difference in contribution to your organization. The next secret is laser focus. 
And this, this laser focused communication um, is, is really um, being strategic and intentional around what it is that you're communicating and how you're communicating to your donor marketplace. Um, donors are looking for um, forward looking, what is the vision, what, what is the urgency. Um, oftentimes when we read um, uh, case materials, uh, what we're finding, what we typically find lacking is this sense of urgency about why give now um, versus, you know, whenever the donor, you know, gets around to it, if at all. Um, it, it's not enough to convey the donors trust us. We uh, we know what we're doing and we know how to use your donation the best. More and more donors want to know the specific difference that they are making and less and less we're seeing donors giving to general appeals. So again, we're looking for impact language that is laser focused on the end result and outcomes that you're looking to accomplish through that donor investment. Differentiate. Uh, this isn't the time to uh, um, um, keep your, your secrets under a rock or under a bush. Um, this is an opportunity for you to really highlight your organization's uniqueness. Um, describe how you are different from similar organizations. We know from the most recent Giving USA uh, data, there's nearly 1.8 million organizations operating in the U.S. Competition, again, for mind share and wallet share is fierce and intense. So as you're looking at similar type organizations, what makes you different? What makes you unique? The donor community, they're listening for that as a part of the philanthropic value proposition. What is different and um, unique about your organization that presents a unique opportunity for them to be a part of the life of your organization um, through their involvement. I want to turn our attention to the case study, which I know is the meat of our presentation today. So again, I want you to keep in mind B-O-L-D, B for benefit, O for opportunity for engagement, L, laser focus communication, and D, differentiate. So I'm going to turn it over to Joanne to walk us through the case study. Thank you. So we're going to look at Evergreen Treatment Services. This is a client of the Alford Group and they have given their permission um, for us to use their materials in this case study. And be, beyond that, they've expressed their gratitude that we are talking about their issue in um, a big public forum. So I'm gonna first give you um, their description of themselves in their words and then I will translate that into lay language. Evergreen Treatment Services is a nonprofit organization with a national and regional reputation for excellence, delivering evidence based substance use disorder and social services in Western Washington since 1973. Through treatment, people are able to take charge of their drug use and transform their lives. So, that is a lot of uh, words, and it's what they're not saying that I think we need to understand. In lay terms, ETS is a drug treatment center. Substance use disorder is how they talk about um, addiction to opioids, heroin, prescription medications. And they very intentionally avoid words with negative connotations such as addict, junkie, drug abuse, and things like that. So, you know, at first blush, it may seem that their language is not clear and not focused, but it's, it's very deliberate. It's a way of destigmatizing, really, the issue of drug treatment. So with that, we'll move on. Looking at the benefit, we're going to look at um, several different ways that ETS communicates its benefits. So I'm going to move rather quickly. I'm just going to explain that in advance. Starting first with a grant application. Risk of death from overdose is reduced by 50% when people get into treatment. Okay, there's no doubt that this is a positive outcome. So they are uh, very much front and center talking about their outcome. This fact is stated in every grant application and it's also repeated during site visits, in newspaper and radio interviews, really in many different um, venues. 
As an aside, I want to point out this um, common grant application form as a good tool for getting started in articulating your philanthropic value proposition. Many states and communities do use a similar tool, and if you're not able to find one, you can search for Philanthropy Northwest and the Common Grant Application Tool is readily accessible. Okay, the next um, way they describe their benefit is through their website. Um, and here's a story that describes a preferred future. Stories, um, about real experiences and testimonials from clients are effective forms of communication. Hearing about your impact in the words of a client is highly credible, and using representative photographs of your clients helps the audience relate to a broader range of, of actual people who are affected beyond just the executive director or the, um, the typical figurehead. So the um, message here is uh, through treatment, people are able to take charge of their drug use and transform their lives. Pretty clear, front and center. Okay, the next example comes from a panel discussion at the Rotary Club. Your chance of dying is twice as high with only social support and counseling as compared with medical medication-assisted treatment. So here they use a statistic well, it's a big sweeping statistic, but it demonstrates the impact. And Rotary is a highly respected and credible forum for communication in our community anyway. This recorded panel discussion can be reused and recycled through links on the website, through Facebook, email newsletters, on and on. The next way of uh, communicating their benefit is through direct mail, and I wanna say yes, we still use direct mail. So the text from this letter, and you know, if you should enlarge this, you'll see that it's an incomplete letter. I just excerpted it so that it would fit on one page. So the text talks about the consequences of the epidemic and the outcomes, the positive outcomes of working together. You know, in this day and age, there are still certain donors who are most responsive to direct mail because it's a familiar format. And so it is in our best interest to meet those donors where they are. If they wish to hear from us and, and receive an appeal through the mail and are responsive in that format, then we will send them direct mail. Okay, the next um, secret is opportunity. So opportunities for engagement are most effective when they're tailored to the audience. We're going to look quickly at three examples. So using the website, this is the landing page when you click on the donate button from anywhere on the ETS website. And what you'll see is um, some language embedded in here. Your contribution will expand outreach and education efforts to some of the most vulnerable members of our society at a time when they need it most. Pretty compelling. Everybody who um, clicks onto this page will receive a message that is general, engaging, and has a long shelf life. And importantly, this general message does not conflict with any of the more tailored messages that follow. Okay, another opportunity for engagement is a grant application. We've identified $300,000 in immediate infrastructure improvements for this year to ensure health, safety, and compliance and provide a secure and uninterrupted service to our clients. We talked earlier about the common grant application form and this message um, will reach 10 to 20 foundations and corporations in 2018 and 19 through grant applications requesting support ranging between $10,000 and $100,000. So uh, it was determined that this was a reasonable goal for this purpose, for, for uh, the infrastructure improvements, given the audience that it was going to. The other opportunity for engagement that we'll look at is this interview in the local business journal. We need to purchase the building at about $10 million. If we lose our lease, we'd have to relocate and we'd have 1,500 unserved patients each day. So this interview, um, 
was published in the local business journal and the message provides a big picture goal as part of a range of opportunities. If you read the full interview, you'll see that it is um, presented in context. This big goal is not appropriate for every audience, obviously, because they're not yet in campaign. But certainly it's appropriate for business leaders who ask for the big picture, and especially in response to the interviewer who asked the direct question, how can we help? So the executive director gave a range of questions um, starting at the minute to the midsize and to the very big. She says, well, we need personal items for our clients who are homeless, you know, socks, you know, hygiene items, things like that. And then she uh, touched on the $300,000 um, health and safety campaign that's going on. And then she got into talking about the really big picture because she knew the audience was uh, comprised of some of the community's um, business leaders who um, that is the stratosphere in which they work and in, in which they make their decisions. So she knew she had to address a really big uh, picture item. Okay, laser focused communication. It actually helps the audience to consume and digest your message the more you are focused. So here's a television interview. The, the epidemic is a public health issue with a very effective intervention. The medication assisted treatment has been proven to reduce overdose. Okay, so this statement lays out the breadth of the issue. It provides specific information about the organization's effectiveness. And thanks to the magic of video, television interviews can be reused or you know, repurposed through YouTube uh, for use on websites, email, Facebook, on and on. It's just really endless thanks to technology. But I do want to um, have a word of caution here. You'll want to refresh your reprints and links frequently. Uh, I would suggest every few years at minimum. You know, you may have the greatest quote from 1975, but it may not be relevant and, and uh, people want to know what has recently been said. Okay, here's an op-ed piece that was published in the local newspaper. Um, data proves that, you know, 10,000 people have died since 1999, et cetera. The problem is too overwhelming without increased support at the federal level, kind of laying this problem at the doorstep of, of the highest level decision makers. So this provides an opportunity to impart important information and at the same time it positions the executive director and the organization as a subject matter expert. Okay, here's a YouTube um, a video. Methadone treatment programs are the gold standard for opioid addiction. So while the executive director is the primary figurehead, in this case, the medical director is also a highly credible and effective spokesperson. And a link to this YouTube video can be distributed through many different communications vehicles as we've discussed. Okay, next, email. Um, email is not used, um, it's not overused, it's very judiciously used in this case. Um, what Evergreen Treatment Services does is issue a quarterly newsletter and then periodic calls to action, such as donating during Giving Tuesday, and in this case, participating in International Overdose Awareness Day. And then there's a blog. Okay, the blog is another way of reinforcing other forms of communication. It's not a primary source of information. In this case, it draws attention to the annual impact report, which is another name for um, an annual report. The three points that are highlighted in the blog outline the organization's impact in clear, simple, and straightforward language. Differentiating yourself from other similar organizations or even from public agencies helps donors understand the importance of supporting you. Okay, so this was a recent site visit. A photo was taken and it was immediately posted on Facebook. We are the largest provider of medication assisted treatment in Washington state. I was there, you'll see my, haha, <laughs> I'm trying to hide behind the sign, but I was there and I heard audible gasps when that statement was made. 
it, it was obviously good to have that feedback. We know that it's an impactful statement. It's in, uh, particularly important to differentiate yourselves when you're addressing newcomers, such as guests on a site visit. Okay, here's a newspaper article. Um, ETS develops and implements innovative programs. We're piloting a program. I mean, this is definitely differentiating this organization from others. Newspaper articles can live on long after the article has been published. If you first request permission to reprint or to reuse, you can use hard copies. We still use some hard copies in a welcome packet for visitors, in a board orientation notebook or other uses like that. And then you can repost the article and excerpts, including a link, you know, at many, many opportunities. Speaking of links, LinkedIn. Um, Evergreen Treatment Services has been very involved in research. Okay, so this quote highlights research as a differentiator. And then LinkedIn itself is one of the most respected social media platforms. As with other forms of communication, the information can be reposted, repurposed, repurposed in many ways. And so to summarize, at this point, everyone listening to the webinar can probably list many benefits of Evergreen Treatment Services. The opportunities for engagement work best when they're tailored or segmented to your audience. Laser-focused communication helps the audience consume and digest your message. And then differentiation is important in all communication and particularly for new audiences as it helps to reinforce the importance of supporting your organization. So one of the things that you noticed as Joanne went through the case of Evergreen Treatment Center was just the variety of the communication platforms that are being used. And you can see from this, uh, from this view, there are tons of opportunities to um, communicate with the, the diverse um, audiences and donors that we're now interacting with. So really, one size no longer fits all. There are just so many different options, and we want to make sure that we're making use of all of the, the variety of ways to communicate with our donor community in a way that's going to grab their attention. And know, too, that we have to change it up. So we can't always do one thing because we know oftentimes it takes seven times of exposure uh, for people sometimes to pay attention. So we want to uh, shake it up and use um, as many of the different vehicles as possible to continue to engage and tell our story. Uh, we certainly know that, you know, traditional forms of communications um, for many of our, I think, our traditional donors, um, they're comfortable with the more traditional forms. Um, but we know that um, as things continue to evolve, that the newer and emerging forms of communications is going to become even more critical so we can grab the donor attention because we know the attention span is very, very short. Um, and so some of the things that we're seeing um, are, are more use of video. Um, Joanne referenced the YouTube uh, video that was uh, posted on their website. Um, and then, too, don't forget to ask your donors, what, what are they listening to? What are they reading? What are the um, channels that they're tuning into uh, to receive uh, messaging from the different organizations that they're involved with? So as we look at leveraging high-impact communication vehicles, um, we know that more and more donors are asking for videos. Donors are four to seven times more likely to engage um, with a video than just static text. Again, they want the interaction. They want to hear the live uh, voices of the, the authorities, of the clients who are receiving the thought leadership that your organization um, um, has as a part of their core values. Uh, we also know as it relates to web searches that when you have a video, you're 53 times more 
likely to appear in the top Google searches. So we all know who are, all of us who are in this world of wanting to be on the top, we're always looking for search engine optimization to make sure that our organization um, is on that front landing page when someone is doing a search for an organization addressing a certain cause or issue. We also understand the importance of interactive storytelling. Um, there's a declining attention span, 12 seconds to 8 seconds, in just the past 15 years. Um, that's not a lot of time when you think about trying to make an impression. Again, um, making good use of infographics, using visuals, using dashboards, um, social media, especially you know Facebook and Instagram stories. And again, we want to make sure that you're keeping this audience um, ready as well. Because I have, I have, uh, yeah, teen. I have a teenager and um, a millennial, and um, they they're telling me they don't use Facebook. So again, if I'm going to get their attention, I'm going to have to think about Snapchat. I'm going to have to figure out how to use Twitter. So again, you want to make sure that you're using the different um, platforms to make sure that you're reaching your different audiences. Uh, one of the things that we wanted to share with you is an Adobe deck um, for one of our clients. I'm here in Chicago, and this is the Chicago Center for Arts and Technology. And what I wanted to share with you is a document that we've worked with them on um, as a part of a, a, a case prospectus document as they were preparing to go into a campaign. Joanne alluded to the fact that a, a philanthropic value proposition, it is not the document. It informs the development of the document um, that you will be using with your donors. So I want to just kind of just quickly take you through this um, Adobe Spark Deck just to, again, show you how we've been able to bring together the visual representation of this particular organization and the different um, uh, social media platforms that we've incorporated um, um, as, through a digital case perspective that they've been using um, as a part of their campaign um, efforts. So again, you see they started out with art plus technology equal choices. And then we go from there, um, they're building a new building. And again, they're calling out the, the value proposition in terms of who are the, the uh, audiences, the, the clients and constituents, um, and what they are making happen for the individuals whom they're serving. So top line, they're pulling out this benefit, demand-driven, sector-focused work readiness, and then it describes the sector and the audiences that they are um, interacting with. Then we go um, into a video where uh, you can go onto the website and actually hear from um, their founder talking about the philosophy of, um, of their organization. And here they um, they're in a campaign mode. So what what we worked with them to do is to look at the different components of the campaign, and they were very upfront around the call to action in terms of what the investment level was going to be for each component of the campaign, and what those dollars was going to make happen. The difference. So for example, the digital art studio it talks about helping young people develop a personal mastery in working with computer technology. So again, this is the value proposition. What is the benefit? What is the opportunity? And why is it compelling? And what, what is the investment amount? Here, um, you can see, you know, they have this big call out about how environment changes behavior, making good use of the, the sustainability nature of the new building. And then they, they are using as kind of their overarching value proposition um, this this last line of, you know, we have the opportunity to catapult an organization from a standing start, because they were a startup, to a stable, effective community anchor. So again, pay attention to the words where they're defining their stated future, the stated future as a stable, effective community anchor. Their strength and proven model make it an excellent philanthropic investment. So again, they're putting it out there saying we are worthy of your support and with support from visionary donors. So again, so imagine this is a new organization. 
They're trying to attract and retain new donors. They're making the donors feel like they will be the hero in making this, this organization strong, effective, stable in the community that they're serving. And with the support from these donors, ChiCat will create clear opportunities for young people and adults. And it talks about the kinds of opportunities that they're creating. So again, going back to this laser-focused language around what it is that's actually being created as well as the benefit. And lastly, who doesn't want to be a part of an organization that will help young people and adults transform themselves and impact um, their communities and families um, in a positive way? And this is the actual building. The building has been built. I was actually there um, earlier this spring um, for a grand opening. So um, this value proposition, again, um, it informs the development to create the, the stated future. It engages with your donor in a way where they feel they can make a meaningful difference to the livelihood and sustainability of your organization. So, Joanne, let's talk about what are the philanthropic value proposition essentials. Right, right. We've discussed a lot of ideas, but sometimes it comes down to just a simple checklist that can be so helpful for getting started and implementing these ideas. So first question to answer for yourself, is your philanthropic value proposition tailored to your distinct audiences? And I want to take just a minute here as an aside to um, just offer a couple of key uh, resources that you might look into. You might know some of them already, but um, there are three here and I'll speak as clearly and slowly as I can. The first is a book called Seven Faces of Philanthropy. It was originally published in 1994, and I, I'm very aware that I told you to refresh your, your links and your resources every few years. This was actually republished in paperback form in 20, 2001, and then it was digitized in 2007. So it is um, keeping current and it is becoming a modern classic. So the seven faces of philanthropy is one resource. The next is high net worth philanthropy. It's a study by US Trust published in 2016. And then mega donor archetypes. This is a very new research published in 2018 by Lippmann Hearn. So that's mega donor archetypes. You can look into those three sources that might help you um, segment your donors into distinct audiences. The next um, item on the checklist is, is the return on investment for a donor's investment made clear? You know, as you um, hone your philanthropic value proposition, go back at it. Take a look back at it and, and ask yourselves these questions. You know, is the return on investment clear? And if it's not, then, then work on that. Does your value proposition motivate donors to make a second gift or continue to support your organization? That's really important, especially when we're focused on the immediate opportunity, you know, the $300,000 opportunity. Well, what are we saying? Um, that will motivate a, a donor to make a second gift or, or to renew their support next year or the following year. And then just make sure that you're using various communications vehicles. We've talked a lot about um, different types of donors and the communications vehicles that they prefer and the importance of um, uh, communicating to them in a way that they will actually receive the information. So just, just Every now and then stop and, and check yourself on that. And then finally, um, does your philanthropic value proposition reflect your organization's boldness? So you can take a look at the BOLD um, guidelines and, and uh, just check your philanthropic value proposition against all of that. Hey, Joanne, I'm, I'm just looking at some of the message, the questions that that's come in, and I and I have a quick one for you that I would be interested in um, you sharing with with everyone on the line here. You know, we've gone through BOLD um, as the 
four secrets around developing an effective philanthropic value proposition. Why do you think it is such a challenge for organizations to develop strong philanthropic value proposition? Oh, that's a good question. Well, it comes down to the reality that, you know, we're busy doing what we do, but we don't often stand back and take a look at really what are some of the most impactful um, activities we can and should be engaged in. And it's uh, carving out time um, to, to work on this. And, and more than just carving out your own schedule so that you can work on this, it's really most effective if you um, look at this as a process an inclusive process that that taps the uh, the expertise and the input of program staff, of marketing and communication staff or consultants if you use them. And I'm assuming that when I talk about you, it's the development officer who is leading the charge to create this philanthropic value proposition. But don't overlook um, including the executive director in the discussion. You know, you don't want to bring them in at the end of the process when you're on the verge of submitting a grant application and she looks at it and says, wait a minute, where did this idea come from? You know, you want to involve her in the process along the way. And then, um, as I mentioned earlier, a good a template for getting started is to take a look at a common grant application because these are the questions that funders are wondering about. They want to know answers to these questions about your organization. So start there. It doesn't have to end there, but certainly take a look at a template like that to get started. Thank you. We have another question. The question is for advocacy-based nonprofits. Do you have advice on how to develop an ROI for major donors? Well, I actually did work for an advocacy-based organization a few years back, and they had to um, track, really, successes, whether it was in the state legislature or, or a larger forum, um, and um, document their involvement in the decision-making process and um, play that back to their supporters. Uh, not just at the state level, the, uh, there were city um, decisions being made as well. Yeah. So they so they were actually documenting laws that they impacted. Uh, they were <coughs> documenting other um, I've done work for a, a large national organization and it's all about the movement and they spend a lot of time um, updating their constituents and their donors um, about the work that their donations are making possible. And I think one of the most effective um, methods that I've seen employed is they really look for ways to engage their donors to show up. Because I think now with all of the, the movements that are going on, people want to have bodies show up. And it's not enough just to send a letter to your legislator um, or your government official, but they show up with their feet and raise their voices. So I think that's another way as we look at the philanthropic value proposition is through that opportunity and that call to action. Um, so in addition to documenting the results and impact, um, it's also providing an opportunity for your donors to be a part of uh, raising their voices and their hands and oftentimes their dollars and support. Mm -hmm. You know, I have a I have a number of uh, clients who who they always want us to help them develop talking points or their elevator speech or pitch. Any insights on how we might be able to use philanthropic value proposition languaging to help boards uh, be even more effective uh, with with fundraising teams and CEOs, Joanne? Hmm. Yeah, you know, um, this presents a good opportunity to put the bold ideas in front of the board and, and have a working session. And I think um, it's always surprising what great ideas come from introducing a new framework to kind of an old discussion. So, so that's um, something that just comes to mind. 
Yeah, I know um, I certainly have been involved um, in working with boards on developing their elevator pitch. And, and we do start with a philanthropic value proposition and emphasize to the board that, um, you know, pull out the piece that resonates the strongest with them. Can we understand when we're working with boards, not every board member is going to be comfortable making quote unquote the ask. And so we tend to look at board members being able to play um, oftentimes one of four roles. Some board members are multi-talented and they can serve multiple functions. So we, we're always looking at that philanthropic value proposition um, to help board members, number one, function more effectively as a storyteller. So again, that's why it becomes important to equip your board members with compelling stories of uh, the impact that you're making on the lives of your clients or customers. So one is helping your board serve as a storyteller. The second is helping your board um, um, better equipping them with with the opportunity and parameters to be a networker and help connect you with others um, in their Rolodex, so to speak, um, to make introductions. So as a part of helping them to make the introduction, um, equipping them with a couple of uh, really strong statistics about the work that you're doing in the community, what makes you um, special or unique because everyone is listening for a reason to say yes, so let's equip our board members with the language to help them help others say yes to an opportunity to get to know you more. Certainly we have those board members who are very effective at telling this, uh, making an ask and asking others to join them, but again, they have to have that philanthropic why give to our organization kind of key talking points. Um, um, in their pocket and also at the tip of their tongues and, and being ready to uh, share that kind of information. And then lastly, we always need board members who are looking ahead and talking about um, the strategic value or direction of the organization and why this organization um, is, is well positioned to do the work that they're doing in the marketplace. So the philanthropic value proposition um, statement or statement can be used with your board members, also with your program staff, and just, I would say, with, with your entire organization to equip all of them to be champions and ambassadors in the larger marketplace. I see we have another question. Um, to Joanne's point that this work falls in, I can't see this, falls among program development and communication staff can you offer any steps on how to start this work? So what is the process? So what do we do to get going to start to, to delve into developing a philanthropic value proposition? Um, yeah, so, um, you know, we have a mantra here at the Alpha Group that um, the most critical um, element to organizational or fundraising success is leadership, leadership, leadership. So I'm going to turn that into saying that um, it starts with a sanction from leadership to em embark in this process, and therefore it becomes an organizational priority, and the program director, the marketing director, the development director, and, and others will um, see that as part of the, the expectation in their role. So, so sanction from the top, and then carving out time. Um, it's the development director's, I think, responsibility to um, create um, bite-sized assignments in developing um, a philanthropic value proposition. So, so it might even start with um, with a draft of some statements that are, you know, already exist, and maybe they can be strengthened. But sending them to uh, various directors and having them comment on it from their perspective, from the program perspective, from the marketing perspective, you know, are we making statements that are as strong and effective as they need to be? Um, so I envision um, regular meetings of this team that is working on this process, and I'm a big believer in making um, meetings fun. So however you define that and however, it, 
works in your organization. You know, make these meetings really special and fun so that people look forward to them. And, and um, again, it's the development director's um, responsibility to manage the process and give out um, bite-sized assignments that people can actually um, uh, make some progress on, come back to the next meeting, report back, and take it from there. I, Andrea, yeah. Andrea, what, what I appreciate about what you're laying out is the, the, the value and the role of the, the development director. And certainly this is um, a process um, that it, it cannot be solely uh, the responsibility of the development professional. It requires a team. So there should be interaction with the marketing communications department, um, your program staff, your volunteers, and the other constituency that, that we've worked with um, in terms of gaining some feedback is going out to your donor community. Um, it, you know, it's one thing to have something, you know, made in-house. Is another when you take it out to your donor community and have some conversations with them and I encourage our, our participants on the call to do that because I can just say as um, someone who's been doing this consulting work now for 15 years and prior to that another 15 years working with major donors the thing that we need to do as professionals is to engage with our donors um, at a higher level and, and, and sit with them and ask for their feedback. Um, as your consultants, oftentimes we have this wonderful opportunity to take your philanthropic value proposition out to the marketplace when you're looking at doing um, some kind of fundraising endeavor, either for an endowment campaign or for a capital campaign. And we have an opportunity to actually sit with your donors for usually sometimes an hour, mainly typically it's an hour, sometimes longer, where we just have an opportunity to talk about their connection to your organization and what really resonates. So when we talked about the philanthropic value proposition not being a document but being used to inform the development of a document, we take that document out and we get feedback from your donors. And it's amazing what your donors are telling us um, in those discussions in terms of what, what they want to see um, happen in terms of the interaction, the kind of languaging they want to uh, be presented when you're trying to engage with them, um, how they want you to position the impact, as well as the opportunities that they want to be engaged with your organization. Uh, we always ask the question, you know, under what circumstances would you support this organization? So we present the philanthropic value proposition for whatever the project is or the special initiative. And of course, the call to action is then asking, how can, number one, how can you see yourself being involved either through a volunteer opportunity as well as through an investor, i.e. donor? And the question of under what circumstances would you consider being a lead donor to this particular initiative, um, we always get responses that relate back to the organization um, really um, being um, um, bold about um, the impact that they're making um, in the organization. Um, they also want to know that there's a sense of urgency around um, the, your fundraising efforts, the urgency either for why you need it now or the urgency for how these dollars are going to help you better address um, the needs of the, the clients whom you're serving, as in the case of Evergreen Treatment Services. There's a sense of urgency given the epidemic nature of, of this particular issue in our society. So they're looking for this bold vision that's gonna get them excited. They're looking for an opportunity to engage appropriately through their time, talent, and treasure. They're looking for a sense of urgency. They're also looking for this once in a lifetime opportunity that's gonna drive them to think about making a donation to you at a transformational level. Now granted, in some instances, you may get, if it's a new donor, and they're testing you, you may get a smaller gift. But as we continue to build the strong relationship and engage them, you're gonna move them from transactional to transformational. 
And part of that goes back to being bold in terms of the stories that you're telling, the ways that you're engaging, the, the messaging platforms that you're using, and the way that you're differentiating your services and organization in the larger marketplace. So a thought occurred to me as you were talking about engaging donors in this process, and um, this kind of crosses the line into donor stewardship, which is great. You know, I'm always looking for um, 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 impactful ways, uh, you know, important ways to engage donors. And, and something that I really like is the small group uh, focus group. So you can think about bringing half a dozen or, you know, no, no more than a dozen donors together and sharing with them your draft um, philanthropic value proposition and, and hearing their feedback. I think that's a completely legitimate um, use of their um, expertise and, and, you know, check one off the donor stewardship column because you will have engaged your donors in a meaningful way. And again, I'm a strong proponent of making it fun and providing good snacks. Yeah, and I, I think bringing a small group together is a great idea, Joanne. Uh, we often do that through small discussion groups. And you're not asking for money, you're asking for their feedback. What's that saying? If you ask for money, they will give, donors will give you advice. If you ask for advice, they will give you money. So, uh, <laughs> so we want to make sure we have a good mix of both. And as you're designing um, your process to engage others in developing your philanthropic um, value proposition, again, we just want to remind you, make it as inclusive as, possi as possible. You want it to be a collaborative effort. It's something that's going to live on in your organization for a period of time. Um, and, and of course, remembering that it, it will be customized because we know with the new emerging donor archetypes, one size does not fit all. You're going to have some donors, they're much more rational in terms of their decision making. Some donors are much more emotional. So you're going to have to have language that's going to be balanced and it's going to be appealing to both of your, to those um, kind of preferences for engagement. So with that, do we have any other questions before we um, end our time together? Join any other thoughts, any other wrap-up thoughts? Oh, gee, um, not really that I can articulate in 30 seconds, but I just want to thank the audience. I, I understand that it, there's a large group, and I just I wish I could see folks and, and interact, but I do thank them for their interest and um, their virtual um, you know, presence. Thank you, and I want to thank everyone on the line. Thank you for joining us today. Hopefully, you've picked up a few ideas and tips that you can take back to your offices and try and um, have some conversations with others. As I mentioned at the beginning, um, this is the second webinar in our fall series. You can see the, the topics that are coming up. Um, on October 4th, we have getting the most from your upcoming anniversary. Um, we know that that's a special time and milestone in the lives of many organizations and you're wanting to figure out how do you maximize that opportunity. And then lastly, preparing your donor database for year-end fundraising. I mean, we're certainly looking forward to a stellar 2018. Uh, we all know we, we knocked the socks off um, in 2017 with our giving um, philanthropically, so it's going to be uh, really uh, interesting to see how we end up in 2018. So again, that's Thursday, October 18th. Um, please keep an eye out for an email later today with the recording of today's presentation, the full slide deck, and a very short survey to tell us how we did. Um, if, you, if we did not have a chance to answer your question today, or if you have questions in the future, please feel free to contact us. Our contact information is here on the screen as well as on our website. We'd like to thank everyone for joining us again. We hope to see you in the next webinar. This concludes today's webinar. We will now disconnect and have a fantastic day. <laughs>